The American life is a busy life. Anybody agree with me here? Wake up, go to work, take the kids to school, go back and forth from various sports practices, binge watching Tiger King season two on Netflix. <laughs> Don't waste your time. I'm warning you in advance. That's a confessional at the same moment. <laughs> Our life is so full with stuff. So full, we pack our schedules to the brim. But there is one thing that we as Americans complain about more than any other culture. That is grocery shopping. Have you noticed this? We're the only culture that views going to the grocery store as a burden or task. And yet we go to pick up groceries and products that we did not grow nor kill ourselves. But there are two stores that make this task, I'm guilty of this as well, a little bit of an adventure. Those two stores are Costco and Trader Joe's. <laughs> you never know what gadget or gizmo you'll find at Costco. And it's always the mystery at the end of what that magic, awful number will be that you try to make sure you keep your, you never keep your budget at Costco, no matter what. Here's a little trick. Never walk down the center aisles. Always walk around the edges. You spend way less. There you go. They don't want to tell you that. But the other store that I think is actually more dangerous is Trader Joe's. It's not great on the budget, but it's horrible on the diet. And if you ever walk into Trader Joe's hungry, you are dead in the water. You are going to buy something that you regret, especially right now. When Peppermint JoJo's pop on that shelf, it is game over. Oreos are my weakness. Peppermint JoJo's, I mean, we're talking bad, bad sin. Like this is, this is, we're in the lion's den of temptation. But what I did several years ago is I said, okay, I want to make my life intentionally missional. And I was one of those extreme couponers. Uh, I went to multiple grocery stores all around the city to try to save a few dollars, and we did. But then the, the rules changed and the coupons changed. So I felt the Holy Spirit say, pick places you can be intentionally missional and build relationships with. I said, okay. So I narrowed it down to three. It was Costco, Trader Joe's, and Grocery Outlet. So as I start to frequent Trader Joe's, I, I start to notice, and this is just a tip for you, start to notice where the different checkers kind of position their station. Go at the same time, and you'll often find them on the same shifts. Get to know their name. Ask how their day is. Engage. You may think that's a small interaction that doesn't amount to much. Oh, it does. And the Holy Spirit will start to tell you things about their lives. Don't freak them out yet. That comes at the right moment. Don't say, God's been speaking to me about you. It doesn't go well all the time. It does not go well. But one day I'm checking out at Trader Joe's, and I hear this conversation between the cashier and the bagger. And so just take, pay attention to what they talk about. Pay attention. And he says, I swear to you, bro, they're real. He says, there's no way. He says, they are real. I felt them and I saw them. I said, what's real? He said, ghosts. I said, no, they're not. He said, yes, they are. I said, no, ghosts aren't real. I believe those aren't ghosts. Those are demons. And I've performed exorcisms. And I walk away. <laughs> and he says, what? I said, yeah, those aren't ghosts. They're demons. He says, well, wait, can I help you with your groceries? I said, sure, come along. He's like, you've seen these things? I said, absolutely. They are real. What you're encountering is real. And unless you've surrendered your life to Jesus, you're messing with the power that's greater than you. He says, oh, man, I have to think about that. I said, okay. And I walk away in the car. And I just start praying. Next week, you're serious, right? I said, I am serious. He comes back to me. He's like, is it true in the Bible, seven sons of Siva? I said, yep, it's real. Unless if you know the power of Jesus, you're messing with things that you don't have power over. So, oh man, I got to think about that. I said, you better think about that. So we build this relationship. One day I'm running over in the Rockland Park where the disc golf park is. There he is on the running trail. So we start walking and running together. Then there's this Bible series that comes out. He says, that Bible story, is this real? Abraham? I said, yep, Absolutely. I said, okay, I have to watch that. He starts, you see the Holy Spirit build this relationship over time. He starts to pull away from ghost hunting. And I want to preserve his name because I've said it before and I have liberty to say so, but people bug him at his store. So let's just <laughs> let him be his, his own person. So God starts to work. He starts to watch this Bible series. I, I can tell the Holy Spirit is setting up this moment, but you never know when the moment's going to be. Don't force it, church. 
Don't force it. We always live with this pressure and burden, especially old school evangelism. We never know the day or the hour. So if I don't give them the full gospel, no. Guess who's in charge of this? Jesus. He's really good. And guess what? He knows the day and the hour and he'll set up every opportunity. So you do what the Lord is commissioning you to do. And so I continue to build this relationship. I have his phone number. He'll text me at times. Well, one Tuesday, I come into this office when we were working here. And I come up the back way, and someone meets me and says, there's someone here to see you. I say, what's wrong? You seem panicked. They're like, it's a big deal. So I walk in, and there he is. I said, what are you doing here? He's like, they're following me again. I said, oh, no. What's happened? He said, I messed up. I went around something with some friends I shouldn't have, and the spirits have been following me. And so I grab my other buddy in the office, and, and you don't know what's going to happen here. And I say, hey, here, here's the deal. We've talked about this. There's only one power greater than what you begin to mess with. But this isn't, I can pray for you, and things can go away. But until you surrender your life to Jesus, you won't walk in the power God has designed you to walk in. I said, but this is not a coer. You don't want to give your life to Jesus just so demons go away. That's not how it works. It's about building a relationship with God that created you and designed you for intimacy with him. So he said, I said, that's what we need to pray about, right? He's like, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. So I, I'm, I, you don't know what's going to come out, right, in that moment. And I start to pray, and the peace of God, the shalom of Jesus falls on this man. And nothing happens. It's like, what are you feeling? It's like, hmm, I feel good. <laughs> I said, great, keep me posted. Go to Trader Joe's two days later. He runs up to me. The spirits are gone. They're gone. They came one night. I declared Jesus' name. They're not there anymore, and they've never come back. That's the power of the God we serve. We serve a God that overcomes the enemy. Now, here's the illusion, church. We as a church, capital C Church, live in a sleep state. And don't understand, there's a real enemy. There's a real enemy, and his intentions are not good for you. He's not declaring Jeremiah 29, 11 over your life. He knows the thoughts and plans he has for you, and they're not for future and hope. He wants to end your life. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your marriage. Hello, church. He's after this, and the apostles talk about this regularly. This isn't an obscure subject where I have to pull it from some weird passage in Greek. It's all throughout the New Testament. There is an enemy that is after your life. Peter declared very clearly, 1 Peter 5 verse 8, discipline yourselves. Keep alert. It literally means to stay awake. It's the same word that Jesus uses and implores the disciples to stay awake on the night of temptation. He says, keep alert. Stay awake. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, he's your enemy. He's not your friend. He's not a casual foe. Your adversary, the devil, the accuser, prowls around looking for someone to devour. That word is not a gentle word in the Greek. It literally means to swallow up completely and to destroy. He doesn't mess with you in hopes to just paralyze you and immobilize you and it moves away. He wants to take your life. But Peter doesn't stop there. He says, listen, you've been called to resist him, verse 9, steadfast in your faith, for you know, capture this, your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. What does Peter immediately bring this back to? You have a community that is behind you. In the midst of trial, in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of difficulty, as the enemy is prowling around, he says, don't go at this alone. Find your brothers and sisters, because guess what? They're going through it too. And this word that they use here is suffering and tribulation and trouble, all pretty much are interchangeable, though different words. And what they stand on is what Jesus declared, is this. John 16, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. 
We can now stand in confidence that when trouble and suffering and difficulty, when giants and enemies come your way, you have one that is greater than any power that's in front of you. He is the one that is not overcoming, but past tense has overcome. And it means to win in the face of obstacles. No matter what obstacle you face, no matter what trouble you have, no matter difficulty in relationship, he has already overcome, and now we get to stand in active victory with Jesus. That's the position. That's what my friend went through when he had those spirits chasing him. But right now, we are at a cultural crossroads. We call this a crisis of calling, where our culture is undergoing it right now. We thought the COVID year was tough. This year has been far more difficult for many as they're standing for their own personal freedoms and there's government overreach taking place and people are losing their jobs over resisting a vaccine or experimental medication, as they're saying no to these things, they're losing their jobs and they're saying, what now am I called to do? What's next? But we as believers have to understand this. Our calling is not tied to our career. They're not the same thing. They're not. They're actually separate. Once you say yes to Jesus, your career is not your identity. Your position in culture is not your identity. Your Instagram followers is not your identity. It's not how it works. See, when you say yes to Jesus, you're responding to a call. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, so I won't belabor this point. But we respond to this word calling, which is kaleo, which means to summon by name. See, many believers are praying that they would know their calling, but they're asking a question that is already answered in Scripture. See, your calling, whenever we see that word, it has to do with covenant. And we very clearly know this. Jesus has called us into covenant. He's called us as his bride, and he is the bridegroom. We have covenantal language that's taking place. He's called us into fellowship and friendship with him and given us a teacher called the Holy Spirit. He's called us into his family. He's called us into his household. And lastly, he's called us his sons and daughters. This is now our position that we have a dad that is a king and is also a father. And from this position as sons and daughters, we are confident in our calling that no matter what's taking place on the outside, we are reassured and trusting him along the way. And right now, many are wondering where they're supposed to go. And again, I made this preface a couple weeks ago and have friends that are moving because God has called them to move. But many are searching for this answer of where they're supposed to be, leaving a state that maybe they're never supposed to leave. Because here's the deal. We have a calling that is fixed, but we have assignments that are fluid. And when we find this word calling in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says this, let each believer live the life they've been called to that the Holy Spirit has assigned to them. And the better question right now is, what is your assignment? What is your assignment? It's a much easier question to answer because we can look at what's in front of us. And what we notice in this passage that is very familiar, 1 Samuel 17, the famous story of David and Goliath, We notice that there's an assignment that David has, but we forget there's another assignment that God was speaking that someone abdicated. And what we're going to look at in this passage, it really has to do with calling and assignment. There are a few subtleties in Hebrew that we miss that I think will open up this passage in a new way. And at the end, I believe that God's going to give us power and strength to face whatever obstacles you're currently facing or confronting right now in your life or your family's life. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 3. It says this, The Philistines stood on the mountain, one on one side, and Israel stood on the other side of the mountain. This was the valley between them. This is the valley of Elah. Here's a picture of what it would look like. As you can see here, there's this giant valley in between with a river that runs. And Israel would have been positioned on one mountain, and we had the Philistines positioned on the other mountain. There's this giant valley in between. So it's locked both of these armies at a standstill. Normally when you're in this type of battle, there's not major resources available to them, so one army would wait the others out as their water supply would end or their food supply would end. They each have the necessary means and provisions of water and food supply, so they are at a lock. They are at a standstill. Verse 4. And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Here we have this giant champion that comes out. The Hebrew word means the man between the two. 
So he is one that is victorious on every front. He is a feared and revered champion. Now, what they have here is called single representative combat. This was not an unusual thing at the time. And what it would do is it would spare mass casualties in war. In particular, in this particular fight, as they would be at a standstill, it would give a psychological advantage to the other side. And now they bring out their champion, Goliath. Now, we have a lot of difficulty understanding how tall actually Goliath was. We've heard various amounts. Here's what one scholar says. He says, the greater these would be, Goliath would be nine feet, nine inches tall, while the lesser would make him six feet, nine inches tall. By ancient standards, even this lower figure would be an impressive height. So he's massive. The best way for us to understand it is picture Andre the Giant. That's what we're picturing here. Or half Thor Bjornsson. You ever seen him, the deadlift world record champion? So there's one of these guys that are just giant humans, a huge person. But what scholars emphasize is this. The reason why we don't have clarity on his height is because the text is not trying to pay attention to his height, but his armor. That's what this says. The text is more impressed with Goliath's armor than his height. His entire body is covered with state-of-the-art armor, and we are intended to envision an impenetrable warrior. This is Sauron in Lord of the Rings. And as he enters battle, you think there is no way to defeat him. He's an impenetrable warrior. As he stands in this valley, as he exposes himself, it begins to melt the heart of the people of Israel. Verse 8. And he stood and he shouted at the ranks of Israel. Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not, am I not a Philistine and you are not servants of Saul? See what he does there? He acknowledges his country and he acknowledges their cowardly king. See, they're technically Israelites that would serve Yahweh, serve Yahweh the living God, right? He calls out Saul and here's what we miss in these texts. Saul is actually the anointed and called one to defeat Goliath. We miss this. 1 Samuel chapter 9 and 10 both imply that Saul has been called and anointed to defeat the Philistines. And in this moment, as his enemy is challenging him, this is Saul's opportunity to stand in the call of God in his life. And yet it says he shrinks. Verse 11, and when Saul, see how they specify, and when Saul and all of Israel heard these words, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Saul shrinks under this intimidation of the enemy. It says he defies the ranks of Israel, and when he's shouting, he's declaring shame and accusation against them. Literally, the voice of the enemy. We see this parallel here. That's that word kaleo. He begins to call. He shouts at them. And Saul, instead of rising up to the opportunity, he sees a giant that's greater than him rather than a God that's bigger than that giant. And he falls and he's dismayed. Literally, dismay means that their hearts were shattered to pieces like pottery. See, the spirit of fear is a strong spirit. So much so that even psychologists recognize that fear is contagious. They had this weird study. I don't know who signs up for these things. But they took these men and had them watch scary movies, happy movies, and gross movies. And they took swabs of their sweat, and they got a panel of women, and they had them smell the sweat to identify the emotion associated with the sweat. I know, right? Welcome to Connection Sunday. After service. No, just kidding. But the most distinguished chemical smell out of all of them was fear. Fear was the most recognizable. And they say this is most likely why pass, you know, mass panic takes place in crowds. Is your body, when it's afraid, releases a chemical reaction. Might I say that spirit has been released in our nation this last year. And the spirit of fear is gripping hearts. It's gripping people. And that same enemy is looking at us and wants his church to succumb to the same spirit of fear. And we have to say no. That same spirit is staring at us. And we have to recognize there's two terms for fear in the Bible. There is a good or a healthy fear called phobos, which is the fear of God. But there's a second fear that's often not talked about, which is delos, and that's cowardice. 
And the one fear that Paul identifies to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7, is that God has not given you a spirit of fear, a spirit of cowardice, but he's given you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. That's the position the church is called to walk in as their culture's in crisis. As the spirit of fear is prevalent and we are susceptible to it, we begin to step back and say, no, God has given me power. He's given me a sound mind. My mind will not be rattled. My mind will not be swayed. My mind will not be deceived in this moment. I fix my eyes on Jesus, the pursuit of my prize. He is the one that we look to, not the government, not what mandates are. What is God saying in the moment for you? As you fix your eyes on him, he steadies your heart. And that's the position in the Old Testament we see David take. And as he begins to defy the ranks of Israel and Saul abdicates his responsibility, here's this young shepherd boy with the anointing of the prophet of God on him, not knowing what he's about to walk into. He goes and his dad says, I want you to take some food to your brothers. And he brings hams and ham and cheese sandwiches. Probably not ham because they're Jewish, but you know what I mean? And so he goes and he takes these sandwiches and he says, hey, here I am with lunch. And he sees this giant. And this giant is shouting the same curses. And here's this young boy says, who is he to defy the living God? Think about this. See, what David does is he says, this giant is nothing compared to my living God. He fixes his eyes to Yahweh. And right now, many of you are facing giants in your workplace, giants in your family, giants with your kids, and the enemy wants your eyes on him when we need to be fixed to Jesus. You may be feeling overwhelmed. I get it. I know it's been a tough season. You might feel like this donkey right here. Where's my donkey at? Do we have my donkey picture? Look at this. You, this might be you. <laughs> or better yet, maybe you've mastered the I'm not overwhelmed face like my friend Will Farrell. You walk around like this all the time. I'm good. Everything's good. We know you're not good when we ask you. But as the famous philosopher once said, you can't be overwhelmed if you're never whelmed. <laughs> right? This is where it's at. And David walks in in absolute confidence. I got Sean on that one. Sean, I got Sean. I got Sean. It's actually a true statement. Whelmed is actually a real word. But anyways, we'll go on from there. He walks with confidence and his words start to stir courage around him. But there's something interesting that happens. His brother Eliab, the one that was overlooked, again, it wasn't that God didn't pick him. He didn't pick him for that task. Doesn't mean that God didn't have a plan for his brother. But he looks at him and he says, who are you and what are your evil motives in your heart? See, the, spirit of this, the same spirit that's on Goliath is on his brother. And he hears it. And David says, it was only a question. And what does David do? This is the powerful moment here. Does David defend himself? Does David get in the spout with his brother? Does David start to argue with him? No, it says he turned away from his brother and began to speak the same words to others. The spirit of fear and discouragement doesn't just operate in the enemy. It can operate in your family. And what David does is the rightful place. Think about this. What did Jesus even say? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? Who is my mother? Those that follow and obey the will of God. It doesn't mean we abandon them, but it doesn't mean we get our source of edification all the time from those that are nearest around us. We may be the ones that need to speak faith into them, and we know because they know the intimacy of our life. Sometimes those words penetrate deeper. And discouragement can come in in a different way. And David turns. It's just like that word repentance, metanoia. He turns from it and looks to the other. And he says he speaks the same thing. God has equipped you with the spirit of truth to speak truth and love and not to cower in the midst of fear. George Orwell says, at least we think he did, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And right now, God has equipped you, as my brother Mark said, with the spirit of truth that has freedom for your family, that has freedom in your workplace, that has freedom for your kids. 
And we cannot abdicate our responsibility to walk in the truth that God has given you. His words are so contagious. Again, courageous words are contagious. They're so contagious, they spread up to Saul. And Saul hears this, and now he has audience with a king. A shepherd boy that is unknown has audience with a king. And he says, how can you entertain the insults of this giant? And he says, what do you want me to do about it? Again, think about this. God brings David. Saul should have said, you're right, I should have fought him. But he doesn't. He abdicates his responsibility yet again. The king is subject to the spirit of fear. He says, what do you want me to do about it? He says, I'll go and fight him. I'll fight this this giant. I'll go and take this giant right now. He says, no, no, no. You're too young to fight this giant. The same voice of discouragement that was on his brother is now in the heart of the king. Disqualification is what the enemy wants you to believe as you look at your giants. But the Lord says, I have chosen, I have qualified you. And he stands there, and then David has this aha revelationary moment, right? This revelation-based moment. He says, no, no, no. I've been training since I was young. No, Goliath's been trained since he was young. No, and whenever the lion, whenever the bear would come and attack the sheep, I would chase them down. I would hunt them down. I would strike them and rescue the lambs from the lion's mouth. We learn that he's been trained and prepared from his youth. God has been preparing you all along here, but in unconventional ways. Every great movie of a hero has a training montage that is unconventional. Luke and Yoda, Mr. Miyagi and Daniel's son, Rocky IV is the best, the best. Everyone has an unconventional training montage. Why do we look at all these movies? They all face a Goliath that they've been prepared to fight that everyone would say they can never win. Everyone has been prepared to fight a Darth Vader a Johnny Lawrence, an Ivan Drago, all of them. You have to identify your giants and ask, Holy Spirit, how have you been training me along the way? We have a teacher, a trainer, an equipper that's soft, gentle, but harsh at times called the Holy Spirit that has prepared you for right now. And my challenge is, Why would you leave an assignment that God has prepared you to take on? Why would you hit eject at the moment you're called to rise up? Follow what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. So what does Saul do? He says, okay, great. If you want to do this, I'll let you do this. And he gives him his armor. But what does David identify? The armor is the wrong fit. He says, I can't even walk in this. I would tie that into this. There's multiple phrases you can use here or ways you can go off. I think the most prevalent one is this. The spirit of comparison is one of the greatest discouragements in the call of God in many lives. The spirit of comparison comes in and it makes us look at the other armor other people have been equipped in. And we desire a calling that is not ours or an assignment that is not ours. And what you do is you long for the call of another that won't fit the context you're in. Have you ever been on a hike or at a job with the wrong equipment? Have you ever worn the wrong shoes on a hike? That's a bad day. And many of us would look at somebody that takes a selfie with a king or a queen. But let me tell you this, those high heels don't work well on the battlefield. That suit jacket don't work well for tactical gear. And we cannot envy what other people have been called to and maybe haven't been called to, but are actually saying no to other things that God has called them to. We don't know the inner dialogue. What is God's assignment and how has he equipped you for now? So David goes, says, I'm not going to walk in this. He grabs his sling and picks up five smooth stones. You read commentaries and everybody tries to give a spiritual significance to this. I'm not going to give you the five points of purpose or whatever it is from this. I'm not going to do that. 
But my favorite thing that I've heard said about this, why did David pick up five stones? Because Goliath had four brothers. David went in that fight never thinking he would miss. He was ready to take on that family. And when you enter these fights that God has called you to enter, when you identify the giants you were called to face, don't think, do I have enough? You have more than enough to win what's in front of you. And as he walks into the valley of Elah and he calls out Goliath, he says, who are you, a young boy? Who are you that you bring me a dog with a stick? He says, who are you calling boy? Come on. I've come here today. And I've been called by the living God, Yahweh. He uses the word living, which literally means raw meat, a rushing river. That's an intimidating title. My God is raw and real, and he's about to destroy you, is what he says. I serve the living God, and guess what I'm here for today? I'm making dinner for the birds of the air, because your flesh is the feast tonight. And as he goes there and he confronts him, this is what's amazing. He runs at Goliath. He... He doesn't, it's not, he runs because he has, he says this, the Lord of hosts, that's the God of angel armies is how it's translated. He ain't running by himself. He's running with the host of heaven. He's ready to say, bring it, bring it, bring it. And he runs out there, puts the rock in his sling, begins to go and lets it loose and it penetrates the skull of that giant and he falls down dead. Now, we know this story, and we've all talked about this many times, and this story is the amazing story of somebody overcoming a giant. Unfaceable odds. But Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, David and Goliath, gives one of the most interesting cases for David and Goliath I have ever heard. I believe it will pivot this moment right now. He says this. The sling was an incredibly devastating weapon. When the rock is released, it would be traveling nearly 100 miles per hour. The stones in the Valley of Elah were barium sulfate, twice the density of normal stones. The rock fired from David's sling is roughly the stopping power of a 45 caliber handgun. In regards to accuracy, slingers could kill a target of up to 200 yards away. Slingers could even hit birds in flight. Slingers were used to stop heavy infantry. Goliath was heavy infantry. Goliath is a sitting duck. Why then do we keep referring to David as an underdog? And why do we believe the victory was improbable? Here's the amazing part of this story. David was the giant. When we face the enemy with earthly tactics and earthly ways, we're outmatched. But we don't fight against flesh and blood. But spiritual powers, and he's equipped you with tools that give you the advantage in the fight. When the reality is, Goliath is the one we should feel sorry for, not David. Right now, God has given you every tool for the task, everything you need to have victory in him, to overcome what's in front of you, if you stand in the spirit with what he's equipped you with. This morning, I want you to identify that obstacle. I want you to identify that fear. I want you to identify that unscalable mountain. And instead of feeling like you have to overcome, we serve the God that can move mountains. Let's stand together today as we pray. My friend Cody shared a story with me a few weeks ago that I thought was a good story, and we we're praying through. I just got word today from another friend that a miracle has taken place. I want this to be a point of edification for us as we pray for God to bring healing in the midst of your life or whatever family member right now. God's doing something. So share briefly what happened at Mills. So my place of missionary lately has been Mills over off Douglas. Um, and it's, it's really simple, man. You don't got to go do nothing. You don't got to go headhunt anybody. And I'll go through and I always carry my Bible with me because it's my sword. And we're supposed to have blood on this every single day when we go home. Too many of us are going home with clean swords. I wear my cross, sometimes I bang my Jesus shirt, whatever it is, and people notice me, and I get persecuted all the time. If you ain't getting persecuted, you ain't doing your job. 
But what it does is it'll open the door for other believers who believe, but they're quiet and they're, they're I don't want to say shame because I don't want to speak that, but they're not free. You can be saved and not be free. And all I did was go to the bathroom and I saw a brother with a cross on. And I was like, that's a nice piece. And I looked at him. I said, bro, I love your cross. God bless you. And he looked at me and he was like one of me. He's like, you know, person who don't look like you should be following Jesus. And I sat down. Me and my queen ate our meal. She went to the bathroom and I was all there by myself. And his whole family walked out and he ran up to me and he goes, bro, are you a pastor? I said, no. He said, he said, I just see you carrying your Bible and your cross. And you came up to me and I felt love and I really need somebody right now. I said, sit down, bro. What's going on? He said, my son, he's in the hospital right now fighting for his life. He's got a 2% chance of living. He's got COVID. He's on ventilators. He's been in a coma. He's not waking up. I said, no, he's not. He's waking up. Because that cross on your neck means a lot more than what you think it does. She said, I don't think you understand 2%. I said, 2%. My God died, man, and he came back. There was no chance. 2% is a whole heck of a lot more than 0%. My God, Jesus only needs a little bit. I'm not doing anything that you guys are not called to do. Jesus says, go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely you must give. All I did was freely give. Freely gave, we sat there, we prayed. He felt Holy Spirit drop over him, shalom of Jesus right there. We go out in the parking lot, we pray with his family. Something hits me, I'm in the car. God goes, you need to holler at about like 12 or 13 people. Just send a group text. And everybody here is here that got that group text. And I just said, everybody come together. We're praying for this boy right now. Stop what you're doing. I don't care what it is. Pray. And one of those people is the man who stands up here and worships God every single day and leads us in that. And it just happened to be his cousin that was in the hospital. He had no idea. I've seen this man again at Mills about two weeks ago. We're always sitting at the same booth when he comes in. And he comes in, bro, thank you so much for praying. Everything's getting better. Everything's getting better. But he sat up in uh, the tube. He came out of a, a coma and they had a tube down his throat to help him breathe from the ventilator. And they sat him up too quick and it cut, his, cut a vein and cut an artery. And he went back into a coma. The devil came back for it. Because when you're doing everything that God has called you to do, the devil is getting hot. So you can either fold or you could go back in. I said, nope, we're not done. We're praying again. I saw him two days ago. Son's out of a coma. Completely awake. Talking about Jesus. Jesus is more powerful than anything that you come against. Anything. Do not be scared. Do not fear. You are called to do the exact same thing. Let's close our Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for the celebration of this man's life. Bringing him out of this coma. We command in Jesus' name complete healing over this man. That we have the testimony. We begin to hear here from Sam of how he is walking and talking and sharing what God has done in his life. Right now, I become before my brothers and sisters as they face giants in their life, as they face improbable odds, I thank you that you have equipped us with all that is needed to face what is in front of us. If you're in a place where you need a miracle, you need God to move in your life or a family member's life, lift your hand up right now.
that's you, come down to the front of this church. We're going to lay hands on you, church. This is not the moment to be timid. Come out now. If you need breakthrough in an area, come forward, come forward, come forward. Thank you. Come forward, come forward. You're saying, I need God to move in a specific or supernatural way with a family member, with a friend. Make room, church. Make room. Come down all the way to the front. Prayer team, we're going to wait one second before we lay hands on people. You see, I need a specific answer to prayer. Come down to the front. Before we lay hands on them, I want you to get alone with God. Put your hands out in front of you. Holy Spirit, would you do work? My brothers and sisters that don't know you yet, would you do work? God's going to meet you. We're going to release the prayer team in a minute here, but you down in the front, God wants to do work right now with you. Those in your chair, God wants to do work. Those online, God's doing work. Stand up if you can at your couch or your chair. Holy Spirit, close your eyes. Get before the Lord. We welcome the warm blanket of love and intimacy the Father can bring. Holy Spirit, the comforter. I just see him bringing his arms and let it go. I feel those tears you're holding back because you might feel embarrassed. We say, release it in Jesus' name. Spirit of fear, be broken in Jesus' name. Anxiety, you have no place in Jesus' name. We declare miracles now in Jesus' name. Eyes closed is a personal matter. You've been trying to get pregnant and the doctor said there's no way. Lift your hand up if that's you. Father, we can declare openness in the womb now. You are the God of life. You ordain life. You know them in the mother's womb. We declare in Jesus' name, fertility. Where there's been barrenness, we speak life. Holy Spirit, do you. Our prayer team, come down to the front right now. Leaders, just begin to lay your hands on people here and just start to declare truth. If you're in the audience today and you're there, just extend your hands forward. God's doing things in people's lives. Holy Spirit, would you come and bring freedom? God of truth. God of comfort, God of hope, raise up your church, raise up your bride, raise up your people, that they would know your goodness, they would know your nearness, they would know your freedom. As you are the chief comforter, we just pray right now, Holy Spirit, for comfort to fill the hearts of your people.